doing today is to thank and recognize all the veterans across the country that have served this great nation so that we could have the freedoms that we have now. Tonight, we are here especially for the veterans that we've interviewed for the Veterans History Project. And we're proud tonight to have the Vanderbilt Naval ROTC to post the flower. Oh, I don't think they're flowers. Post the colors. Gentlemen, ladies, if you would stand for the posting of the colors. I've got four brothers that served in the military, and one of them is going to lead us in the pledge. James Kenneth Lee, my brothers, served in the Navy for 23 years. Ken? If everyone would, place your right hand over your heart, facing the flag, and follow me with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, under God, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah. 
one of my brothers that served in the Air Force. He's going to return to Grace Force tonight. William Henry Lee served in the United States Air Force. Billy? I'm good through it. <laughs> Praise the power that has 
we have some cadets, junior ROTC cadets from Franklin High School and also from Centennial. And like many of y'all, when called upon, they volunteered. And they're here to serve us tonight. They're ready. I'm ready. I think they're coming. While we were getting drinks, I think some of you may have gotten something a little different from what you wanted. So if you would, if you'll raise your hand, we'll come and try to get you what you need again.
You know, I really wish that uh, Esther and I could convey to y'all just how much this program is y'all participating in and what does it mean to us. It has just been such an honor, privilege to interview all of you. I really wish that I could just, you know, thank y'all more than what we're doing here. Y'all just done so much more for this country. But what we would like to do now is play a DVD. And this DVD lists all of our heroes. Thank you.
heard many stories many times about his days in the Army and his childhood. He said that uh, even as a child, he thought he wanted to be in the Army. I'm sure he was out shooting guns somewhere. But uh, he joined the Boy Scouts and became an Eagle Scout. He joined the Civil Air Patrol when he was in high school. And when he attended Mississippi State, he was in the Air Force ROTC. <clears throat> Not long before he graduated uh, from Mississippi State, he was approached by the Army Security Agency recruiter. He had been recommended for the Army Security Agency. So he went through all the interviews and uh, all of the uh, security clearance. He said they even talked to his Sunday school teacher. Uh, he graduated from Mississippi State on August the 12th. 1961 and left the following day for Fort Jackson, uh, South Carolina. Following his ASA school in Fort Gordon, Georgia, he was assigned to North Camp Drake near Tokyo, Japan. His flight to Japan turned out to be a 12, uh, day, 12 days of stormy seas on the USS Breckenridge from Oakland, California. And coming back, he had his flight orders and everything, and guess what? He came back on the same ship, 12 more days of stormy sea. <clears throat> he was a crypto specialist, and telecommunications was his area. And of course, now everything is all on computer and everything is so different. But back then, the teletype was the, one of the major ways that they got their information. Uh, two significant things happened while I was in Japan. Uh, the first one was in 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he said they were locked in their building for several days, didn't even leave their post because they didn't know exactly what was going to happen. And the second was the assassination of President Kennedy. And so the same thing happened uh, again. Many of Guy's buddies uh, left Japan and went straight to Vietnam. And uh, in 1991, Guy and I made a trip to Washington, D.C., and we went to the Vietnam Memorial, and he took a piece of paper and sketched over it to get the names of uh, some of his buddies that he had served with in Japan. He kept in touch with those who did come back, and he would get phone calls, and we would get Christmas cards, and somebody would be in town, and they would call, and we would meet them for dinner. But he did go to, I think it was three of the different reunions, and he loved every minute of it. <clears throat> Some of the things that he said that he learned in the military that just helped him all through his life. Loyalty to country, faithful to duty, be the best you can be, discipline in all as aspects of your life, and putting others before yourself, camaraderie and bonding of friends. Uh, while Guy was uh, in Japan, he decided that he would do a little sightseeing while he was there for three years. So he decided, he and a bunch of buddies decided they wanted to climb Mount Fujiyama. So they uh, hired a truck to take them halfway up and then they climbed through the ashes all the way to the top at night so that they could see the sunrise over Japan the next morning. On the way down, he lost his footing and slid a long way and broke his flight. I brought the flag, I'll show you in a minute. But he glued it back together and taped it back together and it still sits in the corner of our den. This was August of 1963. Uh, he had always wanted to play football. He never had the chance in high school because he had two paper routes, morning and afternoon. He never had the chance in, uh, in Mississippi State because, first of all, I probably wouldn't have made the team. Oh, he wouldn't want me to say that, but, uh, but he barbered his way through college. That's how he paid uh, his college tuition was being a barber. So he had all kinds of hours to work. So he had the opportunity at Camp Drake, they had football teams, and so he joined and his team won the championship, and we still have the trophy. <clears throat> he also visited uh, Hiroshima because he wanted to experience the trauma that had taken place in, uh, in that place. And he said he felt like that uh, many had been lost their lives there, but many had come back to rebuild Japan. Uh, he was discharged from the Army and 1963 at Oakland, California, and he had been gone from home three years, and much to his mother's dismay, he caught the Greyhound bus and rode it all the way back across the country so that he could see his precious country uh, since he'd been gone for so long. 
after arriving uh, back in the States, uh, he went back to Mississippi and he got a job as a sales representative for a plastic pipe company. And then in 1966, he was transferred to Nashville. Uh, Guy and I lived next door to each other in an apartment at the Villager West Apartments. Some of you will know where that is on Fairfax Avenue. We actually <coughs> met at the Dempster Dumpster. We both were <laughs> taking our garbage out together, so that's how we met. Uh, we we um, met in December and married in August. Both of us were a little bit older, though, than some of these people. But anyway, we have two wonderful children. Both of them are with me tonight. Miller, our son, is an attorney here in Nashville. Carrie, our daughter, is a special ed teacher in Metro. Um, they've given us five wonderful grandchildren that I just enjoy so much. Guy was serious about preserving his experience in the military, and his story is now being told, and he would be so proud. Let me show you a couple of things. This is the flag that he carried all the way up to the top, and then fell coming down and broke part of it. Josh asked me a while ago what I was doing with a jet flag here. <laughs> and then he kept talking about wanting to put his uh, patches and his different buttons and things in a shadow box, and we just never got around to doing it. And I came home one day, he was a big shopper, and he had bought the shadow box and he did it himself. So we have that to keep of his uh, army. A memorable video too. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kentucky. The next speaker we have coming up here, most of you probably know. You've seen that smiling face on the other side of the microphone whenever you're doing your interviews. Commander Brian Allen's been gracious enough to do the interviews. He's just been invaluable to us on it. His military expertise, wit, and charm. Well, we'll say any more. Commander Brian Allen. Oh, by the way, the commander is still in the Navy, still serving us in the Navy. Thank you. Well, good evening. Uh, I, I just, I always honored to come and, and spend time in this distinguished company of people. Um, I think probably some people will feel like. Uh, you know that um, they're doing less for me than I am for them, um, but that's not true. I, I get so much more out of these interviews. I, I've, I've been amazed to hear the stories. You know, I've been in the Navy 26 years, and I, I haven't done a quarter of the things that uh, this room has done. And uh, I first and thank you for that, and uh, enjoy it very much. You can see, uh, I found out recently that I've had several relatives that have passed on uh, that served. And, Places like the Battle of the Walsh and uh, Normandy and places like that, they never talked about it. Um, and, and I kind of felt bad that I didn't get to, get to hear their experiences uh, before they went on. Uh, so I, it's kind of almost a, a blessing to, to meet all of you and hear from you and see what you... And, and even the folks who didn't uh, serve in a combat zone, just the stories of that time of uh, American life are, are amazing to me. Uh, there's people in this room that are, are probably going on to serve um, that would love to hear those stories uh, and probably need to hear those stories. As you see our country, uh, the way it's moving, and I, I won't make this a political statement, but um, there's less and less people that are, are leading our country in, on the civilian side that have any some military experience. And I, I think that shows on uh, the decisions that are made and the, the way our country's headed. Um, it, it, you know, we, need, we need the people that, that like you to tell the stories and, uh, and keep it going. My father-in-law, and I understand it, you know, and like uh, Phil said, no, nobody's, nobody here will say, I stand up and say, yes, I'm a hero. Um, you know, you're doing your duty, you did what you thought was right. And uh, talking to Captain Bell, you know, we know some people growing up that they enlisted when they were in their teens, they lied about their age so they could go to where the, the action was. And, uh, and you can't get away with that these days, but uh, you could back then, and uh, because they needed people, they needed them and they signed up. And I think uh, our country's still in good hands as far as that goes, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll be in trouble the day that uh, those people stop doing that. Uh, our, our youth that come up and uh, don't think it's worth fighting for uh, this country and what it stands for. Uh, we see a lot about, we hear a lot about the political side. You know, we do this, we do that. Um, but there are a lot of people out there, and it starts in, in, my, in my time frame, just in uh, 
Grenada, you know, we thought, why are we invading that little country? Well, you talk to the few uh, medical students who were down there, they were more than excited to see a group of Marines show up that day and, and take them home. And, uh, you know, that's happened from that time on. Uh, you know, a lot of people look to us and go, why aren't you helping us, you know, these other countries? Uh, we're not the world's policemen, but we do stand for something. And that stand is, uh, you know, for the right uh, to have a vote and the right to say something and the right, like our pastor said this morning, he doesn't have to worry about someone turning him into the government officials because he's going to preach a sermon that may be contrary to uh, popular opinion. Uh, that's why we have a military. That's why we need to be strong. Uh, I just, uh, I've been in from some flag ceremonies recently and uh, with some retired folks. And it make, does my heart good to see the young people uh, respect the flag. Uh, I think we've lost a little bit about that too in, in our schools. I know I grew up where we said the Pledge of Allegiance every morning. And uh, we stood and we sang, uh, my country tis of thee. And uh, I saw my kids grow up and they didn't really do that in their schools. And I'm not sure why, but uh, we have a legacy though that was left from, from these people in this room and people like you. Uh, and I think there's, I don't know what the counties feel, but there's hundreds if not thousands of interviews on the website. Um, and I could sit there and listen to those all day long. Uh, and I appreciate that from you and I thank you for it. Um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I, I think uh, as you're sitting out there, I, I would say uh, the youth of our country are still signing up and volunteering. They still believe in our causes. And uh, the other side of that is uh, you know, my father-in-law was in Vietnam. He didn't have a very nice welcome home when he got home. I think that's part of the reason he doesn't talk about his experiences. But uh, since then, I think we've learned as a country and, and uh, the people have been treated, the sailors, airmen, marines, and uh, soldiers that have come home have been welcomed with open arms uh, by the citizens, no matter what their political leanings. And I think that does wonders uh, for our military and for our country. And it speaks volumes about what we stand for. Uh, so I thank you again and uh, enjoy your evening. Cliff's going to sing another song for us. Thanks, Cliff. This song was just mentioned, and I'd love for you to sing along. If you'd like to, let's celebrate our country.
Dr. David McCoy, and Dr. David McCoy <coughs> served in the Army. He is currently, or after the Army, he was in uh, 23 years in private practice. He is now at uh, Veterans Hospital downtown Nashville in the post-deployment department. Dr. McCoy, the floor is yours. Just a moment. Um, and also, we have a special thank you that Jenny had wanted to share. Jenny, you would have come back. Hi. Not many people know who I am, but you know my parents. I'm Jenny Wee, and my mom and dad is Esther and Philip Lee. And their mission is to preserve the military history. And I wanted to thank them and tell them I'm very proud of them. And they are doing such a great job, and I'm just so thankful for them. Without them, we wouldn't be here tonight. So, thank you, Mom and Dad. I'm very grateful for Philip and Esther. Um, I'm excited about a project we're working on together called the Museum of the American Military Experience. And we have some of the display materials out in the foyer and some of the cards we'd love for you to take with you and get on the website and look at some of the things we're working on together to preserve our American military experience. And it's not just the stories from the veterans themselves, but it's also the experiences the families have gone through. And um, I'm excited about the opportunity to share some of those stories today. And also, a big project that we've had uh, as a museum was in the footsteps of Sergeant York, and we have some of those flyers out there. That display opened at the military branch of the State Museum downtown just yesterday. And we'll be here in Nashville with that in the footsteps of Sergeant York for six months, and then it's going to go to the Pink Palace in Memphis. We hope to rotate it around the state two or three more locations and then take it on a national tour in hopes that it will end up in France in time for the centennial celebration of the American involvement in World War I by 2017. And uh, that's exciting that we're getting to save and preserve some of that history uh, for future generations. I wanted to share some tonight from the stories of my, from my grandfathers and a few others. Uh, first, some background. As Philip had sort of alluded to, I've been doing this for quite some time. I started uh, collecting when I was nine years old, and it started off with Civil War relics on Lookout Mountain. Uh, climbing up there uh, with the Boy Scout troop, got up there and there was a shoebox with these relics for sale, and I thought, man, this is really something. You can still get these mini balls. So I ended up with four mini balls. That was the start of this long, uh, lifelong obsession. Um, after Collecting Civil War relics, I started when I was nine with a metal detector, battlefields, campsites, chasing after the Civil War stuff all over the country. And also starting at nine years old, every gift that I ever got for Christmas or birthday, it was always either a military artifact or something about the military. So the, the dream started building on itself. The first World War I relic I ever got was my grandfather's helmet. And his brother had made that into a lamp. That really upset my grandfather. <laughs> it's not a lamp anymore, you can tell. Uh, he tore it all apart, told Clyde to leave his stuff alone. Um, it was exciting. My grandfather's name was Claude Johnson. He didn't really have a middle name. He made one up occasionally. And it's kind of like the person doing genealogy research. It's like everyone's nightmare if they keep changing their name. Sometimes it was Claude without an E, and sometimes it was Claude with an E. And he used various uh, middle names according to his mood at the moment. Um, he was one of those that had lied about his age to get in the Army when he was 16. And he crossed state lines. It was from Dayton, Tennessee, and he went to uh, uh, Camp McClellan, Alabama, and, and enlisted there in the Army for World War I. Um, it's interesting that uh, my first book about World War I was this one right here, one of the big little books. This one's called The Great War Stories of World War I. I started getting finally off from Civil War relics and really collecting World War I, though, to an obsessive extreme like my wife could tell you, um, in about the first year of medical school. And I was in school here at Vanderbilt, 
um, I was on a, by this time, an Army Health Profession Scholarship Program that they were sending me to school in exchange for a year for your payback coming back into the Army. And it was an interesting time to be in the Army. We've talked about it and implied some of the issues where it's waxed and waned over the years. At that time, it was shortly after Vietnam, and definitely military service was on the wane. It was not nearly so popular. It's, it was exciting today being downtown for the uh, Veterans Parade, the 2 o'clock parade downtown. The, an amazing representation of the Iraq and um, Afghanistan veterans coming back, and just an outpouring of attention. It, it's changed even in my lifetime from what it was after Vietnam to the way these fellows are getting received now. But I, I started collecting World War I during medical school because I met up with this um, veteran who's, some of his artifacts are outside, and that's what those pieces that are displayed here right outside in the foyer. Um, Mr. Eichenlaub was an Army nurse, and he was in 3rd Division, Rock of the Marne, in uh, World War I. And it was fascinating because he was there some of their big battles when the Germans had tried to force the end of the war and the Americans were really just in time as they were getting up to the um, Martin River crossings to try to defend them. The French were falling back and urging the Americans to fall them back that the end was, was near. And uh, the 3rd Division wasn't going to fall back. It was the same with the Marine Corps and Bella Wood, you know, retreat hell, we just got here. And uh, the Americans have had a way of doing that over and over again in different settings. And Mr. Eichenlaub was right there with the uh, third division, was a uh, litter bearer, and was clearing companies, clearing wounded there in that battle. That's his barracks bag out there. The blue bag is what a duffel bag looked like in World War I. Um, that was his helmet that is out there too with the third division insignia painted on it. And it was fascinating. Um, the stories that he told me, one of the World War I veterans that I had gotten to know. Um, his yard long pictures out there. And it's a fascinating story, and we'll kind of come back to this theme over and over again. Who's going to save this if, if you all don't? And if you don't put it together and tell it to your children and tell it to their children that it gets saved and passed along. And Mr. Eichenlaub, his son, after he had died, brought back all the letters that I had written to him and the letters he'd written to me and gave me the correspondence to save with his material. And he called from Battle Creek, Michigan and talked with my wife and said, we're passing through, we'll bring that yard along. And Dad's brassard, his diary, his medals, all the rest of his World War I mementos, we want to keep it together, will you take care of it? And it's like, yeah, I'm there. That's what I live for. And sure enough, brought the yard along and showed us which soldier in the picture was his father. And you know, you look at all those yard longs, all those pictures, World War I and World War II, and ever since that have been saved, you look at those groups of the soldiers and Marines and sailors and airmen, those are somebody's kin. And who were they? And we don't know if someone hasn't passed along the story, but uh, they called him Ike at the time. Ike's son told us about it and had to save that. The focus always though for me wasn't about the artifacts, it was about the stories. And I was really off on a bench after Mr. Eichenlaub and talking to him and the things he saw and did. Uh, my grandfather's stories had kind of gotten me started and his were written, he, his nickname for me was Little Mike, my middle name's Michael. My grandfather's uh, nickname I gave him was Big Mike, had nothing to do with his name, but he took it right in stride. And I've still got the correspondence notes and things he sent back and forth to me. I still remember a few of the stories that he told me. He told me about sunny France, and it started raining right before the American involvement in Ms. Argonne about the middle of, of September 1918, and it rained till after the armistice. It rained every day, to some degree, heavier, lighter, mixed with snow, but it rains off and on every day. He talked about sunny France and how it never was in his experience. And he told me about how he lost all the hair on his legs from the level of the knees down because the mustard gas was so ever-present and he didn't have the putties off for six weeks that being impregnated with the mustard, it was kind of like the perfect hair removal technique. So he never had hair on his legs below his knees. Um, he finally died with complications of COPD in 1967 when I was uh, eight years old. But you know, the camel cigarettes did a lot for that too. And uh, it's, it's neat to realize um, the legacy these folks, they can teach us all kinds of lessons. 
he had an ongoing argument with a French woman that my uncle had married, and my grandfather, till the day he died, understood and spoke French fluently after being in service in World War One. So he would argue with my aunt about how awful France was. And so that was always fun on the family get-togethers. Um, my f other grandfather, I got another grandfather when I was uh, uh, nine years old when my first grandfather died. Within a year from 1967, I met up with this man out hunting the Civil War relics, uh, Don Grove. And he took over. He was from Loudoun, Tennessee. I grew up in Oak Ridge in East Tennessee. And Mr. Grove, and you know it's funny, until the day he died, I never called him Don. I always called him Mr. Grove. It was a different time. And Mr. Grove, he took over from my grandfather, had been an Army First Sergeant in World War I. His photograph is out there in the German belt buckle on a uh, leather piece that he had carved. It's out there in the showcase on the right, in the right side of the foyer. Um, he could do no wrong. This was a classic experience for me as a grandfather growing up because um, by this time, you know, I was able to understand a whole lot more, 9, 10, 12 years old. Um, but I never realized until I was in college, he'd never been overseas in World War I. And in World War I especially, there was a pecking order. You were in service, you were overseas, you were in combat, you got wounded in combat, you got decorated for getting wounded in combat. So it was definitely that, that hierarchy. I didn't know that Mr. Grove, my grandfather, was on the bottom of their totem pole. But he was active in the American Legion. His American Legion book is out there too. His unit history, he was in an Army mechanic school that was at University of Tennessee, on Chihuahua Park. And it's fascinating. I've looked at it again today, or and yesterday, as I was getting all this together. In that history, he has it inscribed, devotedly dedicated to the girl who is waiting for me from your soldier boy. And it has his wife's name that he did marry, um, Ori. You know, Collins. And then I had a testament of his. I was getting it out to put it in the showcase, picking some pieces. There's a khaki testament right out there in the little showcase. But it was said to Don P. Grove from Agalee. Agalee. That's not Ori. And I thought, well, this must be another girlfriend of Mr. Grove's. I'd always thought it. I'd seen it before. Getting it ready, I flipped it open, and in a penciled inscription on one of the next to the last pages in that Bible, it had this inscription. Dearest Don, take this little book as a lamp unto your feet and a guide to your pathway. Take the man Christ Jesus as your bunkie. God bless and save and bring you home again, our precious soldier boy. Grandma Agalee. And so Agalee wasn't a girlfriend, that was his grandmother. And it's fascinating history like that that is saved because it's somewhere that people can put it together in context and realize it tells a story. Um, this book inscription in American Legion talks about one of his proudest achievements. He led Boy Scout troops from about the early 1930s all the way until the mid-1950s for the Tennessee Department of the American Legion. And that's Mr. Grove's legacy. People like me that were influenced by those values growing up. Um, the relics are there too, though. I had some salty stories, um, some interesting characters I met. And uh, one of the characters I met was a man named Walter Stripling. And uh, it, it was fascinating. One time, this was after I was already in, in college at the time, and he was from Oliver Springs, close to home. He was a distinguished service cross winner. I was thrilled to get to go talk with him and hear his stories and his version of events. And I went up, he was one time, it was in May, a little bit chilly out, he's wearing a jacket. He's sitting in a rocking chair waiting on the front porch of his house for me. Stripling at his squad, and just he couldn't get anybody to go because he thought it's sudden, going to be certain to death if we crawl out of this trench line in these shell holes and start working around behind this machine gun nest. They're looking for the first one to get up. So he manages still to crawl out and get out in no man's land. And his big issue was, wouldn't you know, the first person in the patrol that comes out behind him is Pops. And he was real upset because Pops was this old man in their company. He was in his 30s. And they, he was sure that's great. Pops is going to get killed any minute now. And Pops stayed right with him trying to cover for Walter while Walter was killing Germans and working behind this machine gun nest to take it out. 
but it's cool to realize afterward that comment was even in his Distinguished Service Cross citation that he managed to take out that strong point without losing even pops, without even the loss of a man. The other story that he told me that was fascinating was as they were pinned down another strong point, another battle, uh, they were pinned down completely on the ground. Those German machine guns were hitting typically 12 to 18 inches off the ground as they were laying down the cover and fire. So if you raised up into that window, they'd take your head off. And so they're all pinned down facing the mud, and he's trying to turn over, roll over, to get clear of it, to get clear of that field of fire that they can advance and take out this machine gun nest, and gets hit right in the right hip. And that machine gun bullet hit him like a baseball bat. He said, just right on the hip, and he immediately started feeling the liquid running down his leg. And he looked at he could barely turn his head. That, that soldier, there's two or three of them lying there pinned down together. And he turned his head finally to him and said, so and so, so and so, look, look at my right hip and see how bad am I hit. And so in a few minutes, the, field, the fire shifts and he manages to turn his head and look at Strickland's hip. And he says, oh, Strickland, you ain't been hit. You just well, pee on yourself, but the word wasn't pee. <laughs> and come to find out, the bullet had passed through the canteen and cup, and the cover, and it, it, when it hit the canteen, it felt like he'd been hit in the hip, and in fact, it just hit the canteen, and the, the fluid running down his leg was water from the canteen. <laughs> so, uh, Walter Strippen did manage to, of course, survive the war. He was wounded on another occasion, and he just, uh, was another one of those people that uh, lit my fire about trying to save this history. One of them was in my church growing up, in Robertsville Baptist Church in Oak Ridge in East Tennessee. I knew this man, Coy Ward, that was a deacon in our church, and I just thought he was the greatest thing ever next to my grandfather's. Um, got to know him well. He'd been a squad leader in Marine Corps. Um, he was on Tarawa, and he told me some stories about what he had done in the Marine Corps. Um, he was in the third wave that landed on, on Tara when they were trying to uh, take the beaches. It was early on in World War II. Um, this is how they learned the hard lessons of what you could and couldn't do in island invasions. He, and Coy Ward had this exceedingly dry sense of humor. Just didn't get excited about anything. Now, Strickland got excited about everything. But Coy Ward was just, yeah, that's what happened. Yeah, this is took place. And so I asked him, he said, uh, I hear you got wounded. And he said, yeah, I got wounded. Um, and he, uh, I asked him, well, how did that happen? Where were you? He said, I was in the third wave that landed on Tarl. The Japanese wiped out the first two waves in front of us. Um, they had to come across, of course, the dead and dying Marines, the third wave trying to get ashore. Coy said, there was a pier that came out and that gave them some cover and fire from the interlocking fields of fire the Japanese had set up with their machine gun fire. And um, he was able to work his way in along that pier with a bunch of other guys from the squad. And it was so funny. His big thing was, uh, in his squad, they had a single action Colt pistol that they took turns wearing. And it just so happened, on this particular day, Coy was the one that they let wear the uh, single action pistol. So Coy was convinced this will save my life. You know, I've got the good luck. People were real superstitious about those things, you know. And it was fascinating. He got ashore. They were finally, that third wave took 70% casualties. The 30% of them got ashore, got through the dead and died, started pushing the Japanese out machine gun nest by machine gun nest. And he said they were flying, firing those light Nambus right on the beach, and they were flying stripper clips that as the stripper clip would run out before they could pop another one in, you could get up and rush forward about 10, 12 yards at a time to get a closer attack position on those machine gun nests. So they were trying to work their way up and around these nests. And he said, the clip ran out. I jumped up and said, I got hit right in the top of my shoulder. He said, right across my chest. But there was all this wood blowing up. By this time, they've got close um, um, Shells firing support from the ships trying to get up, trying to save the uh, invasion. And he said, they're blowing up ammunition dumps, there's wood flying through there. I just thought that it was a piece of that wood hit me. They took out that Japanese machine gun nest, and as he was 
advancing to the next one, decided, yeah, it's getting hard to breathe. And then one of the other guys looked and said, why, Coy, you've got blood running off the back, the front of your uh, chest. And it turned out that the machine gun bullet, he'd gotten up one instant too soon, and it hit him right above the nipple, went out the other side of his back, and dropped his lung. And because of that lung deflation, he couldn't breathe. And uh, it was still amazing. Stripling would have been telling that story for hours. And Coy Ward is just, yeah, I got hit. It hit me right there. I was out for a while. I got better. And he was convinced it was because he was carrying that single action Colt. That that was what saved his life, was it was the luck of the Colt pistol. Um, my father had been a Navy corpsman in World War II. And his jumpers out there, his ship's book, The Bountiful, is out there. Um, it's his photo and um, the certificate right there with it. He was at D-Day on seven different island invasions. And he, the story he told me that made such an impression, he was at Saipan, Tinyan, Guam, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, Leyte, and Peleliu. And he said Peleliu was the worst. It was the worst. And his hospital ship typically, as the, they would start hitting the beaches, the first wave, if they could get ashore, the hospital ship would come up right behind the first wave to start taking off the wounded. And uh, they would be as close as they could get to shore without beaching the ship to try to get the shortest possible trip for the landing craft bringing the wounded off the, the beaches. And uh, he said that you'd be up and you'd be seeing what was happening. Peleliu was the only battle where he saw Marines pushed off the shore, fighting in the surf, trying to save each other. And he said, I'll never forget that Marine officer shooting a 45 automatic pistol in water up to his waist, pushed off the shore. And those are things that you think, wow, what, what pieces of history. This last group that I wanted to talk about, though, is Hubert Hunts. And Hubert Hunts is right up here um, on the left. And that was a fascinating story. Where I grew up, um, my mother was from Dayton, Tennessee. And um, visiting my grandmother down there one time, she said, hey, this neighbor across the street has all this pile of stuff that um, she wanted to see if you'd be interested in to save it for your museum. So since I was nine years old, this has been the plan. Someday I'll be part of a museum. And uh, what it was was Hubert Hunt's pieces. And, the, my uh, grandmother's friend said that they had taken in this older woman, didn't have any family at all. She had actually died. Going through her cedar chest, just a cedar closet, they found all these framed pieces. There's a bunch of them out there to look at. They found a Bible box, and they found a stationary box, his purple heart, and just some more correspondence, and would I be interested in it? And it's like, yeah, sure, absolutely. And what it ended up being, that was Hubert Hunt, who was in Battery D, 462nd Parachute Field Artillery Battalion. What was there with his photographs and certificates, you can see him out there, his letters, and then the thing that was fascinating, it was the actual telegram that his mother had gotten that we regret to inform you that your son has been killed in action. The telegram's out there, it's real short, and you think about how life-shattering, life-changing it is. And the rest of the story was fascinating, too. Hubert Hunt was an adopted child. He was adopted from a family up here around Crossville. And he was an only child. They had raised him. When she died, when he died, she had no one. That's how she ended up there. And um, she had saved every letter he ever wrote home. He had mailed home from every paycheck they ever got, postal money orders with most of his paycheck get returned to her. And on his body, when um, it was recovered, his wallet had all of those postal money order receipts still in it. And it had his Purple Heart, all of those frame pieces that she saved. She saved every piece of correspondence he had mailed home. That was in that stationary box that's out there. <clears throat> And it was fascinating, in that Bible box that's out there on the table, has Jesus on the front of it, those are the clothes that he came from the orphanage in when he had been adopted. Patches on patches on patches. And it's neat to look at that and that gold star that's out there, the gold star recognition, and to realize the price that had been paid by so many of these folks. 
and the price that his mother paid all those years, saving all of that stuff, and when she died, who's going to save the story? You know, where will it go? And then finally, I wanted to end it with just a modern day example, somebody that I've run across with my work at the VA, working with the post deployment The sacrifice is still ongoing, and the patriotism and the values and the dedication it's still ongoing. And I've run across this fellow, his name is Patrick Brownfield. And his story, the first place it starts to get preserved, is here on a front page article, Vanderbilt Hustler, <laughs> of all things. This is the student newspaper from down at Vanderbilt. This is October 15th. Vanderbilt senior Patrick Brownfield served three tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan as a U.S. Marine. And it's fascinating the story that's in there telling about him. These are some excerpts from it. From 2007 to 2010, Brownfield served three seven-month tours of duty in the infantry, two in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. There he was immersed in an extremely stressful, relentlessly dangerous environment. Imagine an 18-year-old kid walking 12 miles in 120 degree heat, carrying 80 pounds of gear, with the constant thought in his head, when am I going to step on an IED, or when is a sniper going to shoot me? Brownfield said, you have to stay in that mindset. If at any given time you let your guard down, that's when the bad stuff happens. We have a saying in the Marine, Marines, complacency kills. Born into a military family, Brownfield always knew he wanted to serve his country. I've always had the patriotism, that sense of duty, he said. One of the first things Brownfield did after he turned 18 was contract a, contact a recruiter, and he soon found himself deployed to Iraq, living among the populace and participating in counterinsurgency activity. For the first four or five months, it was completely surreal, he said. You got such a high, such a rush off to going into a firefight or catching bad guys. It wasn't until our unit got our first casualty that we realized that this is real life. This isn't call of duty, it's not battlefield. And an example of that that I have run across lately, that's a whole other area for preservation, for historical uh, preservation part of the museum, was a Marine's tattoo that I'd seen as a patient just a couple weeks ago. They've got some remarkable art going into these tattoos now. And on this tattoo, right up here on his arm, it had that kind of classic comment about all gave some, and then it had five empty shell casings. And on each empty shell casing, it had a different Marine's name that had been killed in his unit. And his comrades, he decided to commemorate that. And it's all, some, all gave some, the five empty shell casings, some gave all with those names. And he's, he'll wear that the rest of his life. On the front lines of the war, Brownfield had to grow up quickly. He was quickly made a team leader, and by his third tour, he had been promoted to section leader, making him responsible for the lives of between 13 and 15 other Marines. For me, I had the responsibility of kids' lives, Brownfield said, and I was still a kid myself. Brownfield had been initially driven to serve by his patriotism and was always motivated in part by his desire to protect his country. But as time went on, he found himself motivated by a different force. I thought, I'm doing this for the guy next to me, Brownfield said. It literally is a band of brothers. That's your biggest motivation, getting the guy next to you back home safely. And that's a quote that it brought to my mind from Goodbye Darkness, this memoir that we in Manchester wrote about his experiences in the Marine Corps in World War II. Just a real brief little quote here. It was an act of love. Those men on the line were my family, my home. They were closer to me than I can say, closer than any friends had been or ever would be. They had never let me down, and I couldn't do it to them. I had to be with them rather than let them die and me live with the knowledge that I might have saved them. Men I now knew do not fight for flag or country, for the Marine Corps, or glory, or any other abstraction. They fight for one another. Any man in combat who lacks comrades who will die for him or for whom he's willing to die is not a man at all. He is truly damned. And 
it's a fascinating thing how often that's the driving force getting through this day, this night, this in, it's issue where truly we're all in arms way together, they do it for each other. And ask Brownfield, ask if he regretted any part of his military experience, Brownfield didn't hesitate. And if I had it to do all over again, I'd do the exact same thing. And my last comments I would just make, these kind of attitudes and values and priorities don't just happen. It's not by happenstance. We need these vets. We need you vets. And we need your stories. We need an attitude of gratitude. We come from a long line of participants. But it will only keep lasting as long as we keep producing people willing to lay their lives on the line for each other and for us and for the values that make us so distinctly different. The duty, honor, country motto from West Point fits, and yet it's rare all the time. We have to have the willingness and desire to give back, and that starts on the level in our schools and in our churches, and in things like the Boy Scouts, those value systems, and that's it. We're so excited that Forrest came along behind me and went and finished as an Eagle Scout, just like I did, just like Mr. Grove wanted me to. It's imperative to pass on to our children and their children these values. And truly, the quote, again, the scripture, I will leave it with, greater love hath no man that he would lay down his life for his friends. And yet, back to that quote from Agali in Mr. Bowe's testament, it's those, that type of love can only come from the God-man, Jesus Christ. And I'm just grateful to be a part of that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. McCoy. There's always a surprise coming some, some of the times on these things. And tonight, uh, we have one of the Centennial Cadets that wants to say a brief word. Cadet Odin. Hello, my name is Shelby Mazzegui Sandra Odin, and I am a JROCT Cadet. Well, as I looked around and got to know most of the people here, I've learned a lot. I've seen some things probably you think a young person shouldn't see, but I have. I've experienced some things in my life, and I know that America is the greatest country that I have ever been. And I've seen so many people here that wish they could be in this country, wish they could say the Pledge of Allegiance. Some people I see in my classrooms, when they stand up, and say the American Pledge of Allegiance, and the Star Spangled Banner, they don't even care anymore. They just talk to their friends. But I know I'm willing to stand up and to have my hand over my heart, or to salute the flag every time I see it, to hold a door for another person when they're in need. And I'm willing to help other people too, because of this great country, I was over there with some nice people who invited me to come. And I was crying when the young lady was up here singing because that's how much it means to me. I am willing to come anywhere and go to the measures because it's very important to me. Nothing, nothing in this world, nothing can change my mind about America or nothing can make me go somewhere else and say that I'm not an American, because I'm not an American. I'm an American, and I'm proud to be an American. And I'm here to look around and say thank you. Thank you to everybody, everybody that put, pitched in and put in their effort and their time to be here. And I salute everybody here, everyone. Thank you. Close to wrapping it up now, but I want to say a special thanks to our speakers, Mrs. Hogan, Commander Allen, Brian, Dr. McCoy, and our cadet. Thank you very much again. Also, we've got a Marine here, Captain 
Kevin Bell. We want to have or say a very special thank you to for bringing your midshipman here. And if you would, please stand while the midshipman retires the colors. Thank you, Vanderbilt University Midshipman. Now, I would be a little remiss here if I didn't thank some of the people that uh, made it really possible for us to all to be here. I want to thank all the staff here at Brentwood Baptist Church for the use of their facilities, both here tonight and while where we did the interviews too. And I want to say a special thank you to John Dyer. John has saved my bacon more than once whenever I was trying to set up the equipment Something goes wrong, and I holler, John, and John comes right. So thank you very much, John. <laughs> one of the others that helped us put this on, Adam Dye, is back there. Adam Dye is the one that figured out how to play these DVDs that I made that uh, could have been better. And also, we want to thank Owen. Owen Crowder is back there, filming all this for us. But there's one group of people here that we owe the most thanks to. And I really want to thank them, and that's our, our veterans. Without you, we wouldn't be here tonight to enjoy the freedoms that we have tonight. When called upon, you gave it all. Thank you very much. Good night, and God bless. <laughs>